Yesterday marks an extraordinary day in the war, as the Wagner Group marched on Moscow in what Putin calls an act of mutiny. Joining me today to discuss these events is Dr. Marina Miron, a military ethics expert from King's College London. What exactly has happened in the last 24 hours in Moscow? That is, that is a very good question because we all were trying to understand on Friday evening, uh, Prigozhin claimed that Russian forces had attacked him. And by the morning, we started hearing that he took Rostov and Don, and um, there was a um, command center for the Southern Military District. And apparently, he was um, calling for justice uh, for the armed forces of Russia, and he was marching towards Moscow to clarify things with the Ministry of Defense. So he wasn't declaring a rebellion. He wasn't saying that he's going to depose Putin. Uh, he was more interested in the Ministry of Defense and um, clarifying things. And he said, you know, if, if we are being attacked by the Russian armed forces, we will shoot back. And so this is what was happening. It was like the whole day we were looking at his march towards Moscow, not knowing what to think. And many thought, oh, maybe there will be a coup or, you know, the power over Wagner has waned and Putin cannot do anything. And so there were a lot of theories of what was going on. And then in the afternoon, uh, allegedly Lukashenko who is the president of Belarus, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, spoke to um, the Wagner chief, to Prigozhin. Uh, he claimed he had known Prigozhin for over 20 years now, and so he uh, wanted to mediate. And after his conversation with Prigozhin, which must have been very convincing, Prigozhin said, we're turning around, we're returning to our camps, and called it off completely without giving a plausible explanation apart from the fact that he didn't want the bloodshed. The problem um, came to light when Wagner started operating in Ukraine and first there was um, not much, they remained in shadows and the first kind of appearances of Prigozhin um, came last year when the Russians entered the operational pause and he, it was every appearance his language became more and more harsh. Um, when talking about the performance of the Russian forces on the ground, about um, how the top brass doesn't deserve to be in, in those positions. So he was criticizing the, the special military operation. He was also the one who was backing uh, the, the appointment of General Surabikin back in October. And so his ambitions changed and he wanted a greater involvement in how the military is being run. Not necessarily um, a political role, but he wanted a seat at the table, possibly uh, replacing Shoigu in order to mold the armed forces into something according to his vision and how, how he was running his own business, how he was running his Wagner group. And that didn't resonate well, but Putin remained silent and he didn't want to enter kind of into this fight between the MOD and Prigozhin. And we know that Prigozhin is very capable when it comes to theatrical appearances. Sometimes he is very calm, writes calm letters, and sometimes he's all emotional, screaming obscenities. And so he kind of um, attracted a lot of media attention through kind of his art. But what we have seen over the past year, and especially if we remember the issue with the ammunition, is that Prigozhin first said, um, the MOD is not giving us ammunition. Where was drawing from Bakhmut when it was about to be taken by Wagner? And then the next day, he reversed the course completely. And so one day, all the news outlets were covering, oh my gosh, Wagner is leaving Bakhmut, how the Russians will lose Bakhmut. And, and so this is the end of it. And next day he says, oh, well, we're, we're, we're staying. Um, yeah, we we so, solved the issue internally. And that kind of showed to me that he, he wanted kind of more attention, more popularity. And whatever he said, some of the things he said, certainly about the corruption in the military and all those things, they're certainly true. However, he's one of, of them. And he's, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how he would offer any different um, kind of leadership, maybe much harsher leadership, but um, he still, still is a part of that system. 
And so when, when it came to this um, confrontation, when the, the, the escalation of the confrontation with the Ministry of Defense, the uh, the background to that is Wagner now withdrew to, to Russia after taking Bakhmut. So he, he transferred control to the Russian uh, forces there. He was true and he was waiting to return to Ukraine with new tasks because his existence also depends on financing from the Kremlin. So he, he needs to, to remain active, to remain in business. Now, the problem was is that um, the, the Minister of Defense, Shoigu, said whatever private companies, private military companies, which are legally uh, not allowed in Russia, they are banned in Russia legally, and you know they turn a blind eye to Wagner and all these other guys uh, like Kadyrov, and also like some oligarchs have their own private military companies, which we don't see mentioned. And so they, the um, Shoigu said, why don't, you know, you need to sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense from 1st of July. And I think that was kind of the turning point where Wagner said, I'm not going to have Shoigu dictate how I have to run my business. Because others don't, the other groups, they did agree to those conditions in order to operate um, in the same structure, in the same command structure as the, the armed forces. And Wagner wanted to, to remain separate from that because he knew better how to command his guys. He didn't want to take um, any orders from corrupt generals who don't, you know, according to him, who don't deserve to be in the position that they are in. And I think that that was uh, why he actually mm, kind of um, tried to use show of force. I don't think he seriously wanted any armed clashes. I think it was more of um, kind of a demonstration rather than anything else, rather than a rebellion, rather than a coup, because in terms of numbers and preparation, if we're talking about an insurgency, Right, it takes years, and I mean, uh, like decades, to evolve. It starts as a grassroots movement, and then you build up your military capabilities. Okay, Wagner had it to a certain extent, but you also build up your logistics. You also have some sort of external support, and you have a grievance that you can address and that you can remedy. And now he was addressing the grievance that the armed forces, the soldiers, are being mistreated and so on. The problem is, um, if you leave Wagner, he, you get shot in the head. So his system is not exactly a very viable alternative because uh, he's very harsh. And, and, and so somebody who is, who is in the military, who's serving Russia, who thinks that he's doing a service to his fatherland is not probably going to 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 join Wagner knowing the consequences and knowing that you're just choosing between two evils either you're you're under that evil command or under that evil command so this message didn't really resonate that much or as much as he thought that it would resonate amongst the armed forces general Surabikin, whom he backed back in october also came out and said that you know he should lay down his arms everything should be resolved and he should stop it. And so I, I think during this march, somewhere this realization came that really, what is he going to do when he reaches Moscow? Realistically, he has 25,000. He doesn't have any air capabilities. He was um, complaining about lack of ammunition. I mean, who's supplying the ammunition? Who is going to supply the ammunition to Wagner? He doesn't have logistics. Since the Wagner group has pulled out of Moscow, it's unclear what the group's next move will be. So right now, as it stands, they're withdrawing to Belarus, where Lukashenko might be keeping a close eye on what they're doing. Uh, one version of this event, was it staged? Was it a Maskirovka to, you know, to distract the, the public, to have the, this, uh, this media storm for one day? And, you know, was all, 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 every single time when Prigozhin spoke, that's kind of the question uh, I was asking myself, is it a part of their information war? Where is it kind of trying to in, 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 insinuate that there is this crack in, within the Russian system in order to make the rest underestimate Russia? 
So if that's a case, which, you know, I wouldn't exclude anything at this stage. Um, how high the probability is, I don't know if that's the case. And Wagner will obviously, uh, Prigozhin wouldn't be punished and he will be repurposed probably to use his troops uh, because he's now very close to the other side of uh, Ukraine being in Belarus to basically um, disrupt or di distract the Ukrainian troops. Even if it wasn't... Uh, some sort of Maskirovka. Even then, I think uh, Putin will have to look for a viable replacement for, for, for Prigozhin, and it's very difficult because Putin doesn't trust anybody. You know, that, that little degree of trust. So fi to find somebody who has the quality of leading those troops and somebody whom Putin can more or less trust with certain tasks will be very difficult. So until then, he might need Prigozhin to stay put, to stay in his role, because as I said, it would be easier just to to maybe send them to Ukraine and say, okay, you don't need to sign anything, go to Ukraine, and then all these 25,000, including Prigozhin himself, will be killed during the counteroffensive, and that, that problem would resolve itself for Putin. So there is that possibility that he might say, you know, we actually need your services, go to Ukraine, this is your new task, and, you know, to keep them busy. And also, if if this kind of mutiny was real, if they are busy on the battlefield, they're not going to plan any actions against Russia. So that, that might be kind of another scenario where Putin will still use them with more caution um, just to have them all eliminated there by the Ukrainian forces because uh, they've always been expendable to him. He never really cared about the death that um, the Wagner group suffers. So I, I think those are kind of the, the possibilities to, to, to still kind of into, uh, use them somehow, either in their inofficial capacity, or he will try to make those fighters join, join the, the Ministry of Defense or sign the contract with the Ministry of Defense and still deploy them to Ukraine, just to make sure that precaution doesn't have command of that amount of manpower and maybe uh, send Prigozhin to Africa to sort the things there and have him far away from Russia. So where does this leave uh, Vladimir Putin? Has he appeared weak in all of this? Well, I, I don't think, uh, uh, contrary to what many have said, I don't think that it weakened Putin in any way. I think it has shown that Putin has more power than Prigozhin estimated. And even somebody like Prigozhin, who has the courage to face Putin, caves. And, and and I think that, you know, after that, I don't think that many of Wagner's troops, they must have been disappointed because there is this Prigozhin saying, I'm marching for our cause. And then it takes one phone call, whatever has been said in that phone call, and he caves. So he's not a martyr. He is just a cover for them. And, 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 you know, it shows Putin's power and Putin's ability to resolve this without having to resort to the use of force. So it shows how much leverage Putin actually has. And it's not, you know, for, for it's a demonstration for whoever wants to, to face me, who tries to threaten me. I have all the tools at my disposal to even not needing to resort to any force to regulate the situation. And, and, and I think that Putin is coming out of this much stronger. President Zelensky has accused Putin of hiding away from the threat. And these events could play into the hands of Ukraine as forces continue the counteroffensive. Well, you know, um, we, we could say that uh, we, so since we don't know how the Wagner Group will be used, will it be used in Ukraine? So perhaps that's the only advantage uh, that because the, the Ukrainian armed forces couldn't hold Bakhmut and, you know, Wagner claims that they retook Bakhmut. So from that perspective, not having Wagner in the game might be beneficial. However, uh, from my perspective, Wagner is used to solve specific battlefield tasks, and those tasks are more offensive than defensive. Right now, the Russians are on the defensive. So the um, reasoning is, and the, Bach, the, the, the Wagner, they haven't been in Ukraine for a while now since they took Bakhmut, they exited Ukraine. So they, they, they 
return to Russia. So whatever has happened with a counteroffensive up to this point isn't because of Wagner, it's because of the Russian forces being deployed in Ukraine now. And so um, it, it is possible that um, Putin will try to fill the gap when he needs uh, to switch to more offensive actions by sending the likes of Kadyrov in place of Wagner, or to send, as I said, the, the Wagner troops who might si sign the agreement. So either way, for, for the Ukrainian forces, there is no immediate advantage as of now, because those who are on the battlefield, they are not playing politics. They have orders, and they are afraid to disobey orders. That's what they are there for, and their order is to defend the territories that Russia has occupied. So I don't think, you know, regardless of their morale and so on, I don't think that this would have any immediate effect on on how the story unfolds with a, you know, with a counteroffensive. What the future holds for the Wagner Group is still unclear, and the events of the last twenty four hours could prove to be a pivotal moment in the war. Simon Banks, The Sun.